So we'll get started in just a second with our amazing presentation on our amazing two articles, um, which I think will give us a kind of um, capstone before we turn back into explicit braidings of psychoanalytic and political critique in the next several weeks to close out our seminar. So today is our last meeting of this section. Um, I'm Hannah Zeven, and I think we all now know each other, which is so lovely. And I'm just going to remind you or re-mention that we have a number of really exciting events coming up at the Psychosocial Foundation before turning it over to Wendy Lauderman for proper introductions. And so at the Psychosocial Foundation, we have um, an event a week from yesterday, so in six days, uh, a conversation on the keyword and the psychosocial melancholy. Uh, and that will be a, a really amazing roundtable with professors Ann Cheng, Ranjana Khanna, and David Eng, and that will be moderated by Jane Hu. Um, and as always, with all of our events, they're sliding scale uh, completely down to zero dollars, um, and you can register for that there. Uh, the next event will be a roundtable celebration for Donald Moss's book, Psychoanalysis in a Plague Year. Don came to speak to us for our very first session on the family problem. Uh, and um, I know he would be delighted to re-catch up with this group there under those auspices. And then uh, sort of the, the last two events, um, I'll just drop the major link in the chat so you can go look at them. Psychoanalysis in the Chinese diaspora, that will be on October 30th, and then Parapraxis in conversation with the psychosocial uh, on the keyword of the clinic uh, with Francisco Gonzalez, Anki Mukherjee, and Camille Robsi, and that will be moderated by Parapraxis editor Noor Asif, and also will be all of those events I think will be amazing, and we'd love to see you at them. So I'll turn it over to Wendy now. Thanks so much for coming and joining us on this Sunday. Um, great. Yeah. Thanks everyone for, for coming today. Um, we're very excited to have, uh, Madeline Lane McKinley, um, introducing or presenting on, uh, Emmy O'Brien's, um, uh, to abolish the family and, um, on Kathy Weeks. We're, we're, um, especially fortunate that, uh, you know, we have Emmy in, uh, uh, in our presence, uh, today. Wait, I just, Sorry, I just lost the Zoom pulling up the PDF. Um, hold on, everyone, I can't see. Um, all right, I, I, I'll just do this without seeing. Um, anyway, um, I will briefly introduce Madeline um, and also uh, um, just give a, a reintroduction to Emmy. So um, Madeline Lane McKinley um, is a writer, professor, and Marxist feminist uh, who did their PhD uh, in literature at the Unifor University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, they're a founding member of Blind Field, uh, a journal of cultural inquiry, um, which we read, uh, we, last week we read uh, their text. Um, their writing has appeared in publications such as Los Angeles Review of Books, Boston Review, The New Inquiry, Entropy, Guts, and Cultural Politics. Uh, they're the author of the chapbook Dear Z and a contributor to the Museum of Capitalism. Um, and their book, Comedy Against Work, Utopian Longing in Dystopian Times, is forthcoming from Common Notions, uh, which is the same press that published Emmy's book, um, Everything for Everyone, which uh, came out recently. And Madeline's book will be um, available in November. Um, so we'll drop a link to that in the chat as well, Hannah, if you, if you haven't already done so. Um, and yeah, we're, we're very excited to have this second week of conversation on on family abolition um, and to have many of the people who are actively writing about this topic uh, in our midst. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Madeline Lane McKinley and um, thank you so much. Hey, uh, thank you, Wendy, for that introduction. And thank you to Michelle and Hannah for inviting me to present today. Um, and to everyone who's participated in the series so far, I've had the pleasure of attending most of the sessions and um, I feel really grateful to be a part of it. I also wanted to say uh, from the get-go, I'm very honored uh, by the trust that Emmy Michelle has uh, extended to me to present on her work today. Um, and I wanted to thank her for that opportunity. Um, all right, well, my, my nerves are a bit frayed to be honest. I live somewhere that could go on fire any moment. <laughs> 
uh, so I wrote something out that I'm going to um, just prepare to, to make sure that it's perfectly legible. Um, uh, I basically wrote all of this also um, two weeks ago uh, on Sunday afternoon uh, after Sophie Lewis's uh, presentation uh, that also included an essay uh, that I wrote in 2018. So some of this is kind of in dialogue with that presentation and um, I'm taking seriously the kind of part two in the title here. Um, so before turning to the two texts that we read for today, I wanted to open by briefly explaining uh, my own orientation toward the idea of family abolition and toward the broader questions being posed by the series on the family problem. I commit this um, not through psychoanalysis, <laughs> as has already been mentioned, but through Marxist feminism as well as utopian studies. And I also come at this as a communist and as a mother. And I would say that my greatest teacher as a family abolitionist is my nearly 11 year old, um, Tuli. In our last session, we briefly looked at an essay I wrote in 2018 called The Idea of Children, which was the seed of a larger project, which is yet to come or perhaps will never be. There is something impossible about that project that I kept bumping up against. And in that spirit, uh, what I'll be discussing today is perhaps much more about the ways that family abolition remains riddled with problems and political contradictions, including its revolutionary imaginability. I wrote the idea of children after years of frustration in various leftist milieu, um, which hardly engaged with children perhaps with the idea of children, but not with actual children or with the ongoing practice of caring for and thinking with children in everyday life. I was also writing from a place of isolation. When I became a mother, I knew only one other mother in the town where I lived. I surrounded myself with friends and comrades who supported me and many of them continue to play roles in Tuli's life. Um, and I'm certainly lucky as a mother in this regard and so is my kid. But in the years after becoming a mother, I also found myself feeling at times non-consensually cast into the role of capital M mother in different leftist contexts, as well as specifically revolutionary feminist projects and spaces. However much I worked on this problem internally, in therapy and in close relationships, it seemed to follow me wherever I went. I learned to sometimes uh, in time circumvent my own interpolation only to watch someone else summoned to play mother or the kitchen bitch as we referred to this role in collective houses. I became fascinated by this problem and in fact researched um, different instances of it in my dissertation. Even where the family was being actively interrogated and transformed through revolutionary comradeship, it lurked in the most painful ways. So this is the heartache at stake in any utopian dream. And it's the heartache that I bring to my discussion of these texts by Kathy Weeks and my dear comrade, Michelle O'Brien. It's also why I'm curious to learn with others in this group who are thinking about the family, the unconscious, and revolutionary struggle. So much of the struggle I will be discussing today takes place on the battleground of the political unconscious. All right, you'll have to excuse me. I have to let my cat out the door or else he'll annoy me. Sorry. <laughs> So a comprehensive and rigorous delineation of the history of a utopian problem, Emmy O'Brien's To Abolish the Family warns us that this is an unavoidably complicated psychic terrain of revolutionary thought. As O'Brien writes in her introduction, quote, for some one's family is a relentless terror from which one must flee to find any semblance of themselves. For others, it is the sole source of support and care against the brutalities of the market and work, racist cops and deportation of officials. For many, it is always both at once. No one can make it in this world alone, and one's personal account of their own families has a direct bearing on how to understand the call to abolish the family. This point is absolutely fundamental in any attempt to think family abolition. 
there is no way to depersonalize the idea of family abolition. It is inexorably, deeply bound up in our psychological experiences of capitalist life. Of course, there are many forms of relationality, whether we call this family or kin or friendship or counter family, or whether we are still developing the language for it. But these are all unknowable from the social totality of capitalism. Rather than disentangle the personal from the political, the idea of family abolition clarifies the political as personal. And rather than assume that when we speak of family abolition that we're referring to a shared vision, we should assume precisely the opposite. To be clear then, by family abolition, I'll be speaking of the problem created by capitalism to quote, drive people into families and block their exits as Kathy Weeks writes in our reading today, for which families are far too many, for, are for far too many, the only source of care and means of service. Whether by inclusion or exclusion, the family is an instrument of violence under capitalism. In our last session, Sophie Lewis spoke of some of the common reactions she encounters in teaching family abolitionist material and the terror often elicited by this idea. Much of this seems rooted in the language of abolition and the association with annihilation, withdrawal, subtraction, and negation. O'Brien anticipates this conceptualization of abolition as well, as she writes from the outset of her essay, to abolish is not the same as to destroy. Among most communist feminists currently writing and conceptualizing family abolition, O'Brien and Lewis share this dialectical understanding of abolition as at once the thorough negation of capitalist life in the transformative and transformational horizon of collective care and sexual liberation. As opposed to a withdrawal of and from resources of care, the idea of family abolition can be redirected toward what Lewis characterizes as an, as an abundance of care and non-possessive love, or as O'Brien powerfully elaborates, care under communism could be a crucial dimension of human freedom, care of mutual love and support, care of the positive labor of raising children and caring for the ill, care of erotic connection and pleasure, care of aiding each other in fulfilling the vast possibilities of humanity expressed in countless ways. Care in this sense is both parts utopian dystopian to the extent that care defines the violence and coercion and conditions of, cap of survival under capitalism. Care also illuminates distinct aspects of what could be otherwise. For O'Brien, this utopian dystopian dialectic in care is essential to revolutionary struggles against capitalist life. As she explains, quote, care in capitalist society is a commodified, subjugating and alienated act, but in it is the kernel of non-alienating inter interdependence and in love. Here, I want to incorporate some helpful framing language from Kathy Weeks's essay. Family abolition, as she suggests, marks the quote, most scandalous demand of feminists in the 1970s. Part of what I want us to collectively grapple with today is this scandalousness, and more precisely with scandalization as a utopian strategy. Elsewhere, Weeks powerfully outlines the predicament of feminists and utopians alike in her groundbreaking text, The Problem with Work. She describes this as the feminization of utopianism. She writes, quote, political realism tends to be associated with a mode of hard-nosed, hardball politics. Utopianism can be understood, built on this traditional gender logic, as both soft-headed, excuse me, I always mess this up, as both soft-hearted and soft-headed, or more precisely, soft-headed because soft-hearted. Where utopian dreaming is not soft and foolish, however, it is instead perceived as a threat. According to this classic anti-utopianism, as Weeks suggests, speculation about alternative futures is at best naive and at worst dangerous. Especially for our purposes today and as a part of this series on the family, another term seems important to integrate, perhaps enveloping both these notions of naivete and danger, which is madness. Utopian dreaming must be understood in many ways as a confrontation with madness, as well as the, uh, with the idea of madness and the social conditions which define it. 
Weeks's parallel discussion of feminism and utopianism clarifies the stakes here as the pathologization of revolutionary desires. Whether it's foolish or dangerous, feminist and utopian thought must contend with what Weeks defines as the realist rebukes of liberalism between the insistence that there should be no alternative and the conclusion that there is no alternative, as she writes. Like any feminist or utopian demand in the sense family abolition poses an epistemological problem. At the heart of family abolition is the task of making imaginable and perceptible what is ostensibly impossible. As a utopian demand, family abolition asks us to question this impossibility, but also to dream, play, experiment, speculate towards the conditions of its own thinkability. For these reasons, utopian thought has historically been bound up in problems of representation. The entire history of utopian writing has been misconstrued by anti-utopians as a unified project of representing perfection. Hence, as Karl Popper, um, my favorite straw man, argued, all utopias are fundamentally dystopian. At a formal level, this is of course true in the Western tradition of utopian literature. Beginning in the 16th century, the utopian island enclave would become likewise the model for dystopian imagination with the failed utopia as the premise of, premise of most uh, dystopian narratives to this day. Yet this uh, simply formal definition of utopia misses the original joke of Thomas More's 1516 text, a play on the Greek for both elsewhere and nowhere. So in this flattening of utopia as a description of the ideal society, questions of non-representation get entirely lost. Both of the texts, both of the texts we read today, uh, for today grapple with utopian representation in crucial ways and help us to get at a feminist utopianism that is methodological, practice-oriented, and guided by revolutionary questions. In Weeks's essay, I found this most fascinating in terms of her reading of Shulama Firestone. And I would note, I have a lot to say about Shulama Firestone that I have not written, written in this <laughs> presentation, but I would be happy to discuss. To the question of what might replace the family, Weeks first turns uh, to what she describes as Firestone's attempt to offer some alternative possibilities as fuel for the political imagination. Such an attempt, Weeks notes, is both parts necessary and foolhardy. On the one hand, she points to the limitations in Firestone's utopian visioning, uh, emphasizing the slippage between politics and ethics as Firestone frames her case for a feminist revol revolution as a quote, matter of individuals choosing to change not only their lives, but what may be their deepest desires, rather than a collective political effort to transform the institutions that shape and limit our possibilities. And on the other hand, and perhaps more importantly, Weeks draws from Firestone's own suspicions towards utopian specul speculation. Quote, it is unrealistic, Firestone argues, to impose theories of what ought to be on a psyche already fundamentally organized around specific emotional needs. We would do much better to concentrate on overthrowing the institutions that have produced this psychical organization, making possible the eventual, if not in our lifetime, fundamental restructuring, or should I say destructuring, of our psych psychosexuality. So O'Brien's text is um, incredible for many reasons, but one is for how it plays in this in-betweenness of mimetic and epistemological problems provoked by the scandalous demand of family abolition. The friction between the desire to represent and make thinkable and the reckoning with what cannot yet be imaginable due to the psychic constraints of capitalist life. Chronicling the emergence and mutations of this demand in the global history of capitalist class struggles, O'Brien ultimately arrives at what I would describe as a communist critical utopianism, that this is the red thread that leads us through all of the um, incredible case studies offered by the text. So a brief note on this terminology of the critical utopia. 
I take the concept um, from Tom Moylan, who introduced the term in 1980 as a uh, an account of the interventions of queer, anti-colonial anti and feminist science fiction writing in the late 60s and 70s. The critical utopia, this bends into the critical dystopia of the 80s. It's an interesting periodization of sci-fi writing. Um, the critical utopia is both an imminent critique of the utopian genre in Western literature and an anti-representational utopian methodology exemplified by works uh, by Ursula, Ursula K. Le Guin, Octavia Butler, Samuel Delaney, Marge Piercy, um, and more. As Moylan argues, quote, a central concern in the critical utopia is the awareness of the limitations of the utopian tradition so that these texts reject utopia as blueprint while pre preserving it as a dream. They dwell on the conflict between the originary world and the utopian society opposed to it so that the process of social change is more directly articulated. And they focus on the continuing presence of difference and imperfection within utopian society itself and thus render more recognizable and dynamic alternatives. As Moylan explains, the criti critical utopia emerges as a meditation on action rather than system. Le Guin mused on this um, shift away from utopian description in a 1982 essay called A Non-Euclidean View of California as a Cold Place to Be, in which she distinguishes a utopianism that is mappable, all the models, plans, blueprints, writing diagrams of the Western tradition from the utopianism at work in her thought. As she writes, quote, utopia has been Euclidean, it has been European, and it has been masculine. I am trying to suggest in an evasive, distrustful, untrustworthy fashion, and as obscurely as I can, that our final loss of faith in that radiant sandcastle may enable our eyes to adjust to a dimmer light and in it perceive another kind of utopia as this utopia would not be Euclidean, European, or masculinist, my terms and images in speaking of it must be tentative and seem peculiar. A critical utopian framework can be incredibly helpful in staging an encounter with family abolition, not looking to this demand to resolve the problem of form, but instead orienting towards the questions, boundaries, discomforts, ambiguities and frustrations that it activates or even aggravates. Hence the scandalousness. To scandalize is to stir up problems and make trouble. O'Brien's essay is careful in its anticipation of all the risks of engaging with family abolition and also applies pressure to past attempts to articulate this demand in ways that are politically necessary. Most powerfully, her essay brings attention to the role of the state in family abolitionist thought, as in her critique of Alexandra Calante, whose vision of family abolition, O'Brien argues, amounts to a replacement of patriarchy with a, quote, new tyranny of work and state. O'Brien also troubles the politics of family abolition through Black feminist critiques, in which the family is often located as a center of resistance, in which were foregrounded um, for this seminar series by Jake Osset's brilliant presentation on Black feminisms and the family last month. Out of all the schools of thought around family abolition emerging from the 1970s, Black feminism remains most critically relevant in illustrating the ways that various Black family formations and kinship structures endure as models for anti-state struggle. Again, the question we have to keep asking is how to understand the project of family abolition in relation to the state. And while O'Brien offers a generous account of radical feminist and gay liberationist attempts to conceive of family abolition as a revolutionary demand, she underscores the ways their analysis ultimately reflected, uh, quote, an overall understanding of society as a whole from a critique of the atomized heterosexual nuclear family. Through her essay, um, O'Brien points to the inadequacies of past utopian visions in order to historicize their attempts to articulate family ab abolition and to examine their politics with the purpose of making revolutionary struggle perceptible in the present. 
What's most remarkable about this essay is the met methodology it provides us for thinking with this demand and for how to also think against it so as to sharpen its edge. I began with a few remarks about my own experience writing about family abolition and my attempts to make a book <laughs> out of what I described as, a, as um, quote, notes written in a moment of urgency in the idea of children. But part of what I was grappling with, I later found was a problem of genre, um, an iteration of the family problem in its own right. Instead of the book, I wrote a book of poetry or a chat book, excuse me, <laughs> which um, instead, excuse me, which in hindsight, especially is a kind of utopian confrontation with madness and the particular impossibility of mothering against motherhood, um, which we discussed in our last session. These insights about my own experiences with genre rushed to my mind last year as I discovered that my dear friend Michelle was still working on a book length version of her family abolition essay, but also a science fiction novel, <laughs> everything for everyone in oral history of the New York Commune 2052 to 2072, as I'm sure all of you are aware. The novel is already out um, with Common Notions Press. I hear it's being printed a second time already. <laughs> And the theory text is uh, forthcoming with Pluto Press in June, 2023. Both are the are very exciting projects and they're getting at the problem through as many means as possible and thinking with genre uh, as a strategy um, for doing so. So this keen attention to genre and how to mess with it is a part of O'Brien's methodological critical communist utopianism which takes seriously the practices of dreaming, playing, and visioning, while orienting towards these practices as sites of speculation and experimentation, always already in process. On a similar note, Weeks opts out of a prescriptive alternative to the family for the most part. And perhaps I am, yeah, I'll say that, and asks that quote, we might instead think about how to create structural and material conditions that are more conducive to their invention. Although Weeks offers a brief list of possibilities for such a political project, I think her more generative uh, propositions come from her discussion of the couple form and the ways it continues to mutate under capitalism. While pointing to the legalization of gay marriage and declining marriage rates, she also looks at what she calls a quote, more promisingly disruptive challenge of polyamory, which can, quote, allow more um, improvisation into the scripted protocols of sexual relationships and contest the binary gender identities and hierarchies that are more easily and often incorporated into the couple form. As she suggests, polyamory is not immune to the family form at all, but can offer an estrangement effect, a utopian strategy we could think alongside scandalization. Ultimately, Weeks models for us what she describes as Firestone, which is a practice of committing to the quote, long game of radical structural transformation that family abolitionism requires. Uh, as she explains, even if we might, uh, even if we might be among the agents that help to bring that future into being, we will not be, and perhaps could not be, the subjects fully desirous of that world. So I want to end here. Um, by posing the thought that if we are to understand utopian dreaming as a confrontation with madness, as I have suggested, um, then it is this madness of playing the long game with a sense of urgency, or in other words, of grappling with the idea of utopia with the purpose of revolution. In confronting this madness, we can see another kind of madness, and in this case, the form of the capitalist family. Um, yeah, so thank you for your time and working through some of this, and I need her to uh, dedicate the rest of the time to discussion and questions. <laughs>